Well, good morning. My name is Dustin Jernigan. I get to be the pastor here. If you would grab your Bible, open up to Matthew chapter 19. And uh, if you don't have a print Bible in front of you, please Google Matthew 19 on your phone or pull it up on your Bible app. Uh, this morning especially is going to be really important uh, that you have a copy of God's Word in front of you as we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 19 quite a lot. Um, if you want to grab a Bible, there are Bibles on the back wall if you would like to give one, uh, get one right now. Uh, we won't mind if you get up. Uh, but friends, turn to Matthew chapter 19. And uh, if you're just joining us, we're going through a series up to Easter called The Community of the Cross. And this morning, we're going to be looking at what it means to be the loving community. Uh, so uh, with that in mind, uh, brace yourself, right? Trigger warning, here we go. We're going to be talking about some hot button issues. All right, so uh, you may already know this, uh, but about 70% of the American diet is processed food. Food containing chemicals that help them, you know, stay on the shelf at Fred Meyer's a bit longer. And processed food is packed full of salt and sugar uh, to make them tasty, right? And, you know, changing one's diet for any of us who have actually tried to uh, is incredibly difficult because uh, we understand that processed food, even though we understand processed food is bad for our guts and our hearts and it's bad for our cholesterol, it's hard to change our diet because we realize that swapping processed foods with real food is really daunting uh, because processed food just tastes better. <laughs> There's no way around it, right? I would rather eat hazelnut Snickers than hazelnuts. And I would rather drink blueberry-flavored soda than eat real blueberries. Uh, but friends, in a world uh, immersed in processed foods, uh, what do you think is happening to us long term? Let me give you just a quick thought experiment. Um, this is just a thought experiment, so uh, just think this through in your head. Um, imagine a, a little girl, a child, and if she was only raised, ever eating, watermelon-flavored gum. She was only ever raised chewing watermelon-flavored gum, and she never tasted a real watermelon. Um, what do you think would happen to her the first time she tasted a real watermelon? You know, if all she had ever known was processed watermelon-flavored gum, when she spat out the gum and bit into a real watermelon, do you think she would even know what she was eating? Do you think she would even like it? Uh, friends, in much the same way, in 2019, we live in a world of processed food, but also processed truth. In our gut, you and I carry a suspicion that much of the information you and I receive is highly processed. The truth is cooked, spun, bent, distorted, and twisted before our eyes in more ways than a baker can knead dough. Uh, the question I want you to think about this morning is if you and I live in a world where the truth is distorted and processed by the talking heads, uh, friends, what would happen if you actually encountered real truth, the truth of God's word? Would you even know what you're tasting? Do you think you would like it? Uh, friends, what we're about to read in Matthew 19 is real, unprocessed, raw truth. Uh, but don't worry, it's not on anything controversial, okay? It's an easy one. It's just on marriage, divorce, singleness, and the male-female binary. So don't worry, it's nothing, you know, contentious today. Uh, but friends, hear me on this. In a world of processed truth, which you feel it in your gut, I know you do, in a world of processed truth, uh, when you and I study the teaching of Jesus, we are hearing real, unprocessed truth from God himself. And uh, friends, if you can't stand what Jesus is about to say about sexuality and identity and marriage and divorce, if you can't stand it, uh, friends, to be intellectually honest with yourself, um, if you can't stand what Jesus is about to say, is it because Jesus was just a naive Jew and was just wrong about the complexity of life? You know, was it just that Jesus just didn't get it? Or is it possible 
that you and I have been raised on a diet of processed truth. And when we taste the real thing, we want to spit it out. If you dislike what Jesus is about to say, uh, is it because Jesus is wrong? Or is it because our taste buds have been deadened by half-truths and distortions of the truth? So, like I said, we're about to dive into some sticky things. So just two things really quickly. (laughs) I know what you're all thinking. Why did I come to church today? (laughs) Everybody else is on spring break. (laughs) Why did I have to come on this morning, right? Well, two things. Uh, first off, you know, if, if your kids are still in the room and you're not ready to have some of these deeper conversations, you know, now's the time to get them out. Uh, but then, you know, that's the first thing you need to know. Second thing, uh, as we talk about marriage, divorce, singleness, and the male-female binary, uh, which just means that God has made man male and female, uh, please know this. So here, listen to what I'm saying. Please know that any discussion of these topics um, needs to start with this understanding. Uh, Friends, we are all sexually broken, and we have all committed sexual sin. Uh, Friends, I consider myself the worst sinner in the room. And as we study God's teaching on marriage, divorce, and singleness, uh, remember that what the church is, is it is a community of sinners who have been chosen and called and redeemed and forgiven by Jesus. Uh, When you come to church You come kneeling at the foot of the cross, not riding in on your high horse. Uh, We don't deem anybody's sin worse than our own. In fact, if you're really a Christian, you know that your sin is worse than others because you know better, (laughs) and yet you still sin. Um, So we know we are broken, uh, but we are gathering this morning to study the teachings of Jesus Christ, God in human form, um, so that we can live in the world that he created for his glory in a way that empowers us to glorify and enjoy him forever. Uh, So friends, you are among friends. Uh, We're a community of the cross, which means we come kneeling humbly at the foot of the cross, not riding our high horse. And uh, I consider myself the worst sinner in the room uh, because for one, I'm paid to be a Christian and I still sin, right? So who's worse, me the hypocrite or you the one trying just to follow Christ? Um, So with that in mind, let's stand for the reading of God's word this morning. This is coming from Matthew 19. Here's the real, raw, unprocessed truth, but do you have ears to hear it and eyes to see it and taste buds to enjoy it? Matthew 19, starting in verse 1. Now, when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And large crowds followed him and he healed them there. And Pharisees came up to him and tested him by saying, Is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. They said to him, well, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? Jesus said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this saying, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, keep your Bible open. Uh, Matthew 19, and would you pray with me? Now, Father, as we open up your word, uh, would you, Holy Spirit, uh, speak through me? And Lord, would um, your truth uh, be conveyed? Uh, and would your word be amplified? And would we have ears and eyes to see it, to believe it, and to apply it? Uh, so, Father, may your gospel humble us and lift us to new heights. In Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, so as we dive into Matthew 19, I'm going to change the way I normally uh, preach. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take this verse by verse, okay? We're just going to walk through these 12 verses one by one together. I don't have three points in a poem at the end. I know some of you love sermons like that. Uh, but today we're just going to go verse by verse, and I'm going to explain it to you uh, so that you see I'm not trying to spin the truth at all. I'm just going to explain what this passage is teaching. All right, so let's start off right there in verse 19.1. 19.1 says, Now when Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away from Galilee and entered the region of Judea beyond the Jordan. And you may think those are just words to sort of gloss over, but let me just press pause real fast on what Matthew 19.1 is explaining to us. And when it says Jesus had finished these sayings, remember that in Matthew 18, right, if you look at your Bible, Matthew 18 was Jesus' explanation to us that the community of the cross, the people that he is forming, uh, the people that you and I are, if you believe in Jesus, uh, we are to be deeply forgiving and deeply gracious. So he just got done explaining to us that we are to be deeply forgiving people because we have been forgiven. And now he shifts as he heads towards Jerusalem and he's going to explain how we're supposed to live in our romantic and marriage life and as single people. And so right there where it says he enters the region of Judea, you see that as he enters the region of Judea, this is one of Jesus' last teachings before Holy Week, before the last week of Jesus' life. And so Matthew 19 and 20 are sort of his last sayings before he enters Jerusalem. And throughout all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is always clear that Jesus understood that when he enters Jerusalem, he's going to die. He knows that the cross looms large over him, uh, that he will be beaten and whipped and mocked. Uh, his beard will be pulled from his face and he will be nailed naked uh, to a wooden cross in front of his mother until he dies. Jesus knows he's going to die. And yet, and yet, he still goes to Jerusalem. When Jesus had finished these sayings, he went away and entered the region of Judea. Jesus um, fulfilling the words of the old prophet Isaiah, set his face like flint and faced the cross. Look at verse 2 now. It also tells us this great little sentence. In verse 2 it says, And large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. Just two quick things on that. Uh, friends, always remember that everybody pretty much loves Jesus. Lots and lots and lots of people like to be associated with Jesus. Even today, lots and lots of people love to be associated with Jesus. And crowds in Jesus' day and in our day love to follow him. But the call of the cross for all of us is to sort of leave the crowd and become a fully committed disciple. You see, the crowds, remember, are the people who follow Jesus. They enjoy eating and seeing his miracles. Uh, they laugh at his jokes. Uh, they like it when he pokes, you know, at the self-righteous people. But when push comes to shove, they're not really sure if they're going to accept everything he says. In fact, Jesus says a lot of things. And in the Gospels, we find lots of disciples say, you know what? That's just a bridge too far. I'm out. And in fact, in the Gospel of John, that exact thing happens. And Jesus is talking about dying on the cross, and it says, and many disciples abandoned him. And Jesus is so discouraged by that, he even turns to the 12 disciples and he says, are you going to leave me too? And Peter, one of the 12, says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of life. And we have come to know and to believe you are the Holy One of God. And of course, in Matthew, it's the large crowds that are following Jesus then in Holy Week, ultimately are turned against him and cry, crucify him, crucify him. Uh, for instance, that begs the question, are you in the crowd? Do you sort of enjoy Jesus? Do you like being associated with him? Uh, do you like to keep him sort of hazy in your mind? Um, or are you willing to be a fully committed follower? Uh, maybe even what he's about to teach about marriage and sexual identity and divorce and singleness, maybe that's the line for you. Maybe you think this is a bridge too far. Uh, but friends, remember the call of the cross is to lead the crowd and become a fully 
devoted follower. And Jesus isn't just um, telling you how to live your best life now. He is not Tony Robbins. He is not telling you how to sort of, you know, have a fulfilling life. Uh, He is so much more than that. Look at verse 2. In verse 2, it says, large crowds followed him and he healed them. And what that tells us, it's not sort of he metaphorically heals them, right? He, he heals the wounds of their past. What that means is he physically, miraculously healed people. Jesus is divine. He doesn't just teach us about having a fulfilling earthly life. If anything, what Jesus will say is, don't worry about your earthly life. Take up your cross and follow me, and I can give you an eternity that will never, ever cease to amaze you. <laughs> See, Jesus is not just a human teacher. Yes, he's human, and yes, he's a teacher, but he's so much more. And so that's why we listen and we trust him, because he is God among us. He has divine power. Um, He is on another level categorically. Uh, Friends, um, if, if your best math teacher growing up said to you one day, I am math, I am subtraction and division and multiplication, and no one can comprehend math apart from me because I am math. Uh, Friends, you would cease to say you're a great teacher. You would say you're crazy. And when Jesus says things like before Abraham was, I am, and when he says things like, I am the resurrection, I am life. uh, Friends, we are entering another realm of who this man is. All right, so now let's go into verse 3. And Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any reason? All right, so why in the world would this question be a test? It's that, you know, the Pharisees, who are sort of self-righteous religious people, good thing they don't exist anymore, self-righteous religious people, Right? These self-righteous religious people, they come up to Jesus and they're trying to test him. So why would this be sort of a gotcha question? Um, well, it's because, guess what? Marriage, divorce, sexual identity, and singleness were controversial before the year 2016. And before the year 2019. They were controversial in Jesus' day. And remember, Jesus has a lot of people who are sort of on the periphery, sort of in the crowd, kind of watching him, being interested in what he's saying, but maybe they haven't really decided whether he's the real deal or not. So the Pharisees see these big crowds, and they make a great um, calculation. And they realize we can cause some people to abandon Jesus. So we're going to ask them a trick question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And friends, you see, that was a trick question. Because in Jesus' day, God's people, the Jews, were deeply divided into two camps of interpretation. On one end, you had a rabbi named Shammai. And Shammai was very, very strict and very, very conservative. And Shammai taught strict adherence to the law. And so Shammai said, yes, you can get divorced, but only if your wife commits adultery on you. That was one camp. On the polar end of that, on the other end of that spectrum, you had a rabbi named Hillel. You may have heard of the rabbis Shammai and Hillel. Hillel taught, actually, on a very liberal side, that any reason you deem appropriate is grounds for divorce. If your wife, he goes on to say, if your wife burns your dinner, that's grounds for divorce. Because God's not uptight. God understands life is messy, right? Um, Aren't you glad people today are not on polar ends of a spectrum? Good thing the Bible doesn't apply today. Sorry, that's sarcasm. We're Presbyterians. We're really sarcastic. Uh, It totally applies, and I hope you saw that, right? So what the Pharisees are doing is they're looking at these crowds, and they think, well, I know we've got one really strict group of conservatives over here, and we've got these real loose liberals over here, and I don't even really care what Jesus' answer is. They don't really, the Pharisees don't really care what he says. What they're wanting to do is split up the community. And so they say, well, Jesus, how do you answer that tricky question? Because no matter what you say, you're going to lose some people. And that's really what we want. Well, notice what Jesus says. In verse 4, he answered, 
Have you not read? He's incredulous. Haven't you read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. You see what Jesus does is he says, don't you remember like the first page of the Bible? It's literally the first page. It's Genesis 1. They want to know on what grounds a guy can ditch his wife. And what Jesus says is, don't you know that a man and a woman are equally made in the image of God? And you're asking me how to ditch your wife? She's made in the image of God, and when you married her, you entered into a physical and spiritual unity with her. And this has been the case from the beginning. This was God's design, was for a man and a woman to be linked. So if you're trying to ditch your wife, you've missed the whole point. She is not something to be discarded. She's something to be valued and treasured because she is equally made in the image of God. This is Genesis 1. It doesn't get any more basic than this. God says he has made us, he has made man in his image. Male and female, he created them. Both men and women are equally made in the image of God. And you're asking me how to ditch your wife? See, is it any wonder then why the Pharisees don't really appreciate Jesus' response? You know, and they may be thinking exactly what you're thinking, right? Well, the Bible allows for divorce, right? I know it does. So don't talk to me about this whole men and women equally made in the image of God. That's, I, don't, I don't really care about that, Jesus. What I want to know is what can I get away with? Look at verse 7. They said to him, and maybe like you're thinking, well, doesn't the Bible allow for divorce? They said to him, well, then why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send her away? And they say, well, in Deuteronomy 24, it says a man can divorce his wife. So why is that in the law? And notice what Jesus says in verse 8. He, says to, he said to them, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, from Genesis 1, from God's design, that wasn't the case. That was not so. You see, what they're, what they're doing is what we often do, which is sort of, we ask, well, you know, well, what can we get away with? Well, why does God allow for divorce? And what's really interesting is the way they phrase this. They say, well, then why did Moses command us to give our wives certificates of divorce? But if you go back and you actually read Deuteronomy 24, that's not exactly what Moses says. What Moses actually says in Deuteronomy 24 is he says, if a man divorces his wife because he finds something he doesn't like about her, if that happens, he needs to give her a certificate of divorce. Because in the ancient world, if a wife was kicked out of the home, um, living as a single woman was very, very, very difficult. And so she would be forced to marrying a new husband. But imagine if a woman, for instance, is kicked out of her house, by her husband, and she tries to go and find a new husband. And right before she marries the new husband, the old vindictive husband says, no, 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 you can't marry her. She's still my wife. Is that treating that woman fairly? No, what Moses says in Deuteronomy 24 is, hey, if you're going to divorce her, you better give her a certificate so that you never have any claim on her ever again. See, Jesus says, Moses allowed for this. Moses didn't want this to happen, and neither does God. And in fact, you know, anytime there's divorce, there's some instance of hardness of heart, right? That's what Jesus says in verse 8. There's some kind of hardness of heart, meaning that um, there is sin, some kind of sin was involved. And uh, friends, I know many of us in this room are, are children of divorced parents, or we have been through divorces. Uh, so don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying everybody who has been divorced or through divorce is somehow um, in the wrong, that you're somehow guilty. Uh, what Jesus is saying is some, at some point, something went wrong. And I think we can all grasp that and understand it without necessarily saying that you individually were the one doing the wrong. Uh, Jesus is mourning this as we all should. So 
What then? Is, is there any possible scenario for Jesus to see where divorce could happen? Well, he says in verse 9, he says, And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, commits adultery. It seems what Jesus is saying is he's saying, yes, there is grounds for divorce. Um, if you're cheated on, you can divorce your spouse. Uh, but that's, uh, that is a uh, terrible experience to go through. Uh, it grieves God's heart. Uh, but there is cases where divorce can happen. Uh, but clearly, um, God's design, God's hope for your marriage is for it to stay together. Okay, so, you know, what in the world? What are we supposed to do with this teaching on marriage, divorce, and being made in uh, the image, right? Male and female equally. Well, uh, first off, if you're single, uh, let me try to speak to you real fast about what this means. If you're single, uh, what I would encourage you to do as your pastor is um, I would plead with you uh, to date and try to marry somebody who loves Jesus, somebody who's going to point you to following him. All right, so find somebody who loves Jesus uh, because any marriage uh, that you are going to have, uh, remember that it's you and your spouse, but it's God who joins you you to your spouse. Remember, that's what Jesus says right there, verse 6. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. So find somebody who loves Jesus. Do everything you can. Um, If he ugly, you'll think he's attractive one day, right? (laughs) Uh, That should be high on the list. Does he love Jesus? Do I respect his walk with the Lord? Is he going to point me And is he going to love me, not just because he thinks I'm lovely, but is he going to love me because Jesus is calling him to love me? And also what this means is biblical sexuality means you and I are called to be chaste while we're single. We're called to be chaste while we're single. Well, what if you're married? What does this mean? You say, well, whew. You know, thank God I haven't gone through divorce. What does this mean? Well, friends, what this means for you is you've got to be totally, radically faithful to your spouse. Love your husband. Love your wife. Uh, And it's very, very hard to do that because you marry a person, and guess what? They're a sinner. (laughs) And guess what? We are too. And it makes life very, very, very difficult. And sometimes you may want to quit. But friends, have deep Deep faithfulness to your spouse. Love them, not because you always think they deserve it, but you love them because you know God loves you even when you don't deserve it. If you're married and you're having trouble, seek help. Go to somebody. Come talk to Pastor Richard and I. Um, God can redeem your marriage. He may not redeem every marriage. God allows for divorce, uh, but plead with him if you're having trouble. Uh, Go to the church. Uh, Seek Christ. Um, Now, what if you've experienced divorce? You know, what about you? Well, what does this mean? Well, um, I know you've already done this, uh, but if you haven't, do the autopsy. Find out where sin entered and what ruined it. And remember, it may not be, you may not be the one who sinned, uh, but find out where sin entered. And for many of us who have been divorced, we've gotten remarried. Well, does Jesus want you to now divorce your new spouse? No, not at all. Uh, Remember that the first person Jesus ever told that he was the Messiah, the first person Jesus was like, hey, you, I'm the Messiah, was a woman who had been divorced four times and was on her fifth husband. And he says to the woman at the well in John 4, he says, I am he, I am the Messiah. And he doesn't say, well, now you need to divorce your husband. What this means for you if you've been divorced and remarried is, one, do the autopsy uh, with honesty, and then do everything you can, everything in your power to love your spouse now with everything that you've got in the power of the Holy Spirit. Be radically faithful to them. Like I said, nothing controversial, right? Well, if you don't like what I just said, you're not alone. Because guess what? Even the disciples don't like what Jesus just said. Look at verse 10. The disciples are incredulous. They're offended. Their toes hurt. And they're mounting their argument against Jesus already. Look at Matthew 18, verse 10. The disciples said to Jesus, If such is the case of a man with his wife, it's better not even to be married. Talk about pouty face. 
You know, talk about some mama's boy that need to grow up, get out of mom's house and cling to their wives. It's better if I'm stuck in this. Man up. Stand up straight with your back tall, right? Love your wife, right? But they don't like it either. But here's where the passage starts to get fascinating. Because what they say, what they say is, well, pfft, you know, if I'm stuck with this woman and I can't drop her because she burns my dinner, you know, I'd just rather not even get married. I don't want to be stuck to this woman. And Jesus, oh, Jesus, don't you get it? Love your wives. Um, you know, Jesus has to explain this over and over again to the Christian community. And in Ephesians 5, what Paul says is he, he's pleading with men and he says, men, you are called to love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. And just as he washes us with the water of the word, husbands, you are called to sacrificially love and serve your wives and to wash her with the water of the word. But the disciples aren't there yet. They just rather abandon marriage because it's too hard right now. And so they have this kind of throwaway saying, it's better not to be married. See it right there in verse 10? It's better not to marry. It's better to be single. And Jesus catches that phrase and he's sensitive to it. This idea that it's better to be single. It's advantageous to be single. He catches this phrase because remember, Christian, Jesus was single. Jesus lived as the 33-year-old virgin, and he died the 33-year-old virgin. And when the disciples sort of poo-poo being single, Jesus grabs that and says, we need to talk about being single. And what does Jesus say about being single? Look at verse 11. He says, well, not everybody can receive this saying. And what the saying is, is the saying the disciples just said, which is, it's good to be single. It's better to be single. Jesus is not saying, everything I just said about marriage and divorce is sort of optional if you want it to be. That sort of negates why he said it in the first place. What verse 11 is referring to, he says, no, not everybody can receive this saying. The saying is, it's better to be single. And you say, hey, not everybody thinks it's advantageous. Not everybody um, can live a single life, but only to those to whom it is given. And part of the Christian understanding of marriage, divorce, sexual identity, and singleness is we've got to understand that singleness is not a curse. Uh, singleness is a calling on everybody's life. Anybody here born married? You were single. And friends, you will spend eternity single. Do you not know that you and I will be like angels in heaven? We will need be given nor receive each other in marriage. That's what Jesus says. Singleness is not a curse. Singleness is what you are bound for, Christian. It's what you were born into. We need to be careful, Christians, that we don't idolize family and marriage. You know what an idol is? An idol is a good thing that you make the ultimate thing. That's why you can't stop worshiping it, because you only see it as a good thing. But an idol becomes an idol when you make a good thing the ultimate thing. Family and marriage are good things, but we can't make an idol out of them. Friends, the Christian church, we've got to embrace the call and the blessing of singleness. Uh, friends, we've got to hire pastors who are single and not count it against them. Uh, when people tell us that they're single, we can't pray for them like they got cancer. Oh, no. Let me pray for you. What does Jesus say about singleness? Look at verse 12. Jesus, the single man, sensitive to the topic of singleness, wants us to op open and expand our minds to the beauty of the call of being single. Look at verse 12. 
Jesus goes on, he says, for there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this receive it. And what Jesus says, what let the one who is able receive this, what he's saying is singleness is not for everybody. If you are called to singleness, this is what applies to you. But, you know, you don't have to be single to be a Christian any more than you need to be married to be a Christian. Remember, Jesus and Paul, both single. So what does Jesus mean by this word eunuch? Now, if you don't know what the word eunuch uh, means, uh, eunuch was a man in the ancient world who would have been castrated. His genitals would have been mutilated so that he was incapable of sexual intimacy. Now, why in the world would you do that to a man? Uh, One of the reasons the ancient world did that is if you were a king or a lord, and let's say you had a really low view of women, and you didn't see them as equal to you or bearing the image of God, you would maybe have a bunch of wives and concubines. But, you know, how do you handle that many wives? Who gets to be in charge of that? You can't put one of them in charge, you know, because they're just women. So what do you do? You take one of your young servants, maybe when he's a boy, you crush his testicles, and then he never, ever has to worry about cheating with one of your concubines, and you put him in charge of all of your wives and concubines. That's what a eunuch was. And remember, Christian, one of the first people, one of the first persons who comes to faith in Jesus is a eunuch, and he's a black guy. He's from Ethiopia. And in Acts chapter 8, he comes to Jesus because he knows God's word. So what does Jesus say to those people, to single people? Well, Jesus says, look, there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. Well, what does that mean? Well, what Jesus means there is simply there are some people who are born physically with chromosomal issues and physically um, ambiguous as to what they are. Uh, this is a physical, biological condition. There's, a, there's been a bunch of you know, words throughout time that we have used to refer to people whose um, you know, private parts um, don't look typical. Uh, but now the term is intersex. And what we mean by that is they are actually physically either impaired or they have a disability or there's a genetic mutation down there. And Jesus says, yes, there is still male and female, and there is a small category of people who are somehow ambiguous in their physical bodies. But that doesn't negate the male-female binary, that men are men and women are women. But yes, in the Christian understanding, there are eunuchs who have been that way since they were born that way. And then notice that he goes on, he says, yes, so some people are never capable of sexual intimacy, Uh, because they were born in a way that prohibits them. And then he says, there are eunuchs who have been made so by men. That would have been like that poor young boy in Ethiopia who was a servant and forced into working for his uh, master. And then this is where Jesus gets utterly fascinating, because then Jesus says, there are eunuchs that have been made by men. There are eunuchs who are born that way through no fault of their own. And then, and then there are people who are metaphorically eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom. They are people who choose to remain single, to not give in to their sexual desires because they want to live fully for Jesus and his kingdom. There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And friends, um, don't miss it. Jesus himself was a eunuch, metaphorically, for the kingdom. Jesus gave up having a wife and a family and sexual intimacy for the sake of the kingdom. So what then is the Bible's teaching? What is Jesus telling us? Well, essentially, all Jesus is teaching is that if you are single, you're not cursed, it's not bad. Um, You may be called to being single, maybe not. But what you and I are called to be in our single life is chaste, just as Jesus was chaste. And if you are married, you are called to be married, completely devoted to your husband or your wife. That there are men and there are women. That the male-female binary is in effect, don't you know God made them male and female? 
And yes, there are physical eunuchs, so to speak, that are hard to categorize, but that doesn't overturn the reality of men and women. We have compassion and love for those people. So, what do we do with this? Um, if, you, if you'd like to study this more, I want to encourage you to read the book, Holy Sexuality and the Gospel by Christopher Yuan. Uh, he's a Chinese-American who struggled with same-sex attraction most of his life, and he has committed his life to being a, a metaphorical eunuch uh, for the kingdom, right? And so if you would like to study this more, um, I've got that book. I'd love to give it to you. If you have questions about what this means, come email me. My email is in the bulletin. Let's talk about your life and your story, and let's find out what following Jesus looks like. Uh, but remember that the biblical ethic is chastity and singleness and faithfulness in marriage. And that doesn't mean that any of us have done that perfectly. Remember, we're all sexually broken. But we come to Jesus because he really does have the words of eternal life. Uh, so, friends, let me just finish. You know, what diet are you living on? Um, are you consuming processed truth? Or are your taste buds awoken by the Holy Spirit? And is it possible that Jesus, the 33-year-old virgin, um, is actually capable of filling whatever is missing in your life? Um, what if the community of the cross actually met you where you are? And even in your call to be holy, in your marriage or singleness, what if Jesus filled in the gap you think is missing? Uh, what if you're making an idol of a good thing? And what if Jesus was the ultimate thing? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus. And Lord, uh, we pray that you would forgive us of our sexual sins that we have committed. And Lord, that we would walk in holiness. Uh, for those of us uh, who are single, uh, Father, would you comfort us? Uh, Lord, would you throw open doors and living rooms and dinner tables uh, so that we would experience the community of the cross? And uh, Father, for those of us who have husbands and wives, uh, would we love them profoundly as you have loved us through Christ? And Lord, would we be found faithful? And so, Father, would you give us compassion uh, for those that disagree with us? Uh, Lord, would we love them well? And uh, Lord, we pray for them. And Lord, we ask that we would find unity around the teachings of your son, Jesus, who alone has the words of eternal life. Amen.